Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. The coming year is a big one for space science. In this episode, you'll hear from two scientists involved in NASA's largest projects. First up is Nancy Chabot, planetary chief scientist at Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory. She's a leader on the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, which examines whether it's possible to deflect the trajectory of asteroids which someday might pose a threat to Earth. Later, Meredith McGregor, a planetary scientist at CU Boulder, explains the mission of the $10 billion James Webb Space Telescope, which launched on Christmas morning to explore the origins of the universe. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. 2022 is a big year for space science. NASA has two major missions underway. And in this segment of Q&A, we're going to learn about both of them. I heard there's an asteroid or a comet or something that you don't like the looks of. (sighs) Tell me about it. You got 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Go. Uh, A comet between 5 to 10 kilometers across that we estimate came from the Oort cloud and using gauss's method of orbital determination and the average astrometric uncertainty of 0.04 whoa 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 whoa, whoa. i'm so what? bored just tell us what it is this, this seriously what? stop what dr mindy is trying to say wow. is that there's a comet headed directly towards earth and then what happens like a tidal wave it will be far more catastrophic there will there will be mile high tsunamis so how certain is this there's 100 percent certainty of impact please don't say 100 percent. we just call it a potentially significant event but it isn't potentially going to happen 99.78 percent to be exact oh great okay so it's not 100 percent i'm gonna call it 70 percent and let's just let's move on dr nancy chabot that's a clip from the trailer of the current hit movie on netflix flix titled don't look up you know it's one of a long series from hollywood disaster films centered around asteroids uh, or meteors striking earth but now science is is catching up with art and you're involved in a project called dart that revolves around this tell me about it yeah dart is the double asteroid redirection test mission it is a nasa mission to demonstrate a technology to deflect an asteroid So maybe you could prevent this from happening to Earth in the future. How serious is the threat of an asteroid striking Earth? Yeah, that's a really important question. So Earth has been hit by asteroids for billions of years. That's not new. It's happened in the past. It will happen in the future. That said, there's no known threat to the Earth right now from asteroids or comets. uh, We're tracking things. There's nothing on a course to hit the Earth. You know, that said, we haven't found all of the asteroids yet. So this is an important part of planetary defense, along with missions like DART, is actually to find all of the asteroids to be able to assess that threat better and take the first steps to be ready in case you needed to before you need it. And that's where DART comes in. We have seen uh, news reports in the past about meteors striking the, the Earth. What's the difference really between an asteroid and a meteor? Yeah, so meteors are kind of refer to the phenomenon when they get bright in the atmosphere, when they are burning up in the atmosphere. So you can, you know, look up and see those meteors as they come in. Some of them make meteorites, which are the rocks that survive and are here on the planet. And for example, um, it really depends on the size when you talk about these objects. So something that's four meters in size or so is the Earth once every year, roughly. And things smaller than that hit all the time. Actually, um, I got my PhD studying meteorites. And so I love meteorites. Meteorites are like free samples from space that let us look back into the early solar system. So it's not all bad. Um, There's actually quite a lot of good about it. Um, It's just when it gets bigger that you can get this devastation. And those are the ones that you're concerned about. So it's really important to distinguish between the size of the objects when you're talking about things hitting the Earth. So how large would an object have to be to cause significant concern or damage? Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, so it's uh, a lot of times people think about the dinosaur killers or uh, in the movie, as we were talking about, these kilometer-sized objects. And those are the ones that would cause extinction-level events, sort of a kilometer and larger. Now, the ones that are that size, um, we have found more than 90% of that population. We're tracking it. None of them is a threat to the Earth. So we're really kind of concerned about these ones that are a few hundred meters or so. So something 140 meters in diameter was modeled uh, by a a lot of experts repeatedly to be something that would cause regional devastation is how we talk about it. So it would wipe out a city, a small state, 
um, sort of tens to hundreds of kilometers damage, very devastating. Now, these are rare events, but they are things that uh, could happen. And this is a population of asteroids, actually these few hundred meters that we found less than half of currently. So it's very important to be finding these asteroids, taking steps to do that, and then also being step, taking steps to be ready in case we needed to. It, how much notice would, would Earth's inhabitants have if there was a dangerous asteroid heading our way? Yeah, that's the really important key. Warning time is really an important factor here. You don't want these things sneaking up on you, which is really the premise of the Hollywood blockbusters, which is why it's so important to be taking the steps to finding all of the asteroids now. And so the idea with something like DART, for example, is the sort of deflection where you're not disrupting the asteroid. You're not blowing it up. You're just giving it a small nudge. And this is something that you would do decades in advance. To be able to do that decades in advance, you have to find the asteroids decades in advance or more. And that's what we're actively working with for planetary defense as well. The DART mission launched in the last week of November 2021. How many years in the making was this? So DART uh, began uh, NASA funding in 2015. Um, and so it'll go through 2023 for the final data analysis. Uh, before that, it was a sort of a spark in somebody's eye. Uh, one of my colleagues here at APL, uh, Dr. Andy Chang, uh, came up with the idea while exercising in his basement. He's got a great story actually that I just love because this really shows how things go from being ideas to reality. Um, so that was before 2015, but then socialized at various uh, conferences, talked with other experts, and in 2015, NASA started investing in the mission. What did he envision when he was exercising at home? <laughs> well, I, you know, his exercise routine seems like it might be a little different than mine. I guess he thinks about how to save the world from asteroids that might hit in the future. Um, but it was really the binary asteroid system. So like the name of the mission says, the double asteroid redirection test, this is a double asteroid system. So there's two asteroids there. And why that is so important for the DART mission is that we're hitting the smaller moonlit asteroid, which goes around the larger asteroid um, every 11 hours and 55 minutes. And so we're just going to define Deflect that smaller asteroid around the larger one ever so slightly. So the deflection is within this binary asteroid system. It's within this double asteroid system. That makes it a really safe way to do the test. But also, it's something then we can measure with telescopes that already exist here on the Earth. And that's really where the ingenious part comes in. We know from telescopes on the Earth that discovered this system back in 1996. For decades, we've been watching it. We know this smaller moon goes around every 11 hours and 55 minutes. We're going to change that by about 10 minutes, maybe 5, maybe 20. That's, uh, that's the main measurement that DART's going to make. And uh, it's not going to be made by the spacecraft. The spacecraft's job is to deflect that thing ever so slightly, but then it will be totally destroyed telescopes on the Earth will make that measurement. And that's really where the ingenious idea came in to use this double asteroid system for this first technology demonstration of how you might prevent an asteroid from hitting the Earth in the future. Were there other asteroids under consideration or was this the only obvious one? It really is the ideal target, this Didymos Dimorphos system. It's a binary asteroid system, which in the near-Earth object population is about a third of all the asteroids out there. So there are other ones, but there's two important components here. One is that as viewed from Earth, sometimes the moon passes in front of and sometimes behind the other one. So the brightness of this system changes with time as seen from Earth. So you need this eclipsing binary as viewed from Earth. That's one important component. And then the second important part is that in 2022, the distance between these asteroids and the Earth are going to be minimized. Um, you know, both uh, the Didymos Dimorphos asteroid system that we're targeting goes around the sun. The Earth goes around the sun. Sometimes they're on opposite sides of the sun. That's not super great for using telescopes to see how much you deflected the asteroid. In 2022, September of 2022, they're gonna, that distance is going to be minimized. It's still... 11 million kilometers, so nobody should be worried. But as far as telescopes are concerned, they're going to get the most precise data they, they've ever gotten. Would you explain the role that NASA has in this mission and the role of your organization's Johns Hopkins APL? Yeah, so DART is built and managed uh, at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, where I work for NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office. So it is a NASA mission that is built and managed and operated here at APL. Um, along with APL, we have other partner institutions um, across the country, and we actually have a large number of international team members that are contributing this to us as well, because uh, 
planetary defense is an international issue. And that really is one of the pillars of the national planetary defense strategy is international cooperation. With something that is NASA's first defensive mission, which makes it historic, was the newly formed U.S. space agency involved at all from the Defense Department? Uh, this has been a NASA mission. It's been uh, NASA's uh, is the one that's tasked with doing planetary defense missions. Um, there is a national plan that was developed in 2018 that involves multiple agencies, of which NASA is one. Um, but in there, it lays out that missions like this are firmly in NASA's uh, purview and control. So this is a NASA mission. Tell me about your particular role in this project. I'm the coordination lead uh, for DART. It's a sort of a new position because like you said, this mission is a little different than some of the um, science missions that NASA traditionally runs, being the first one out of NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office. And so my role is to sort of uh, help uh, organize and coordinate our very large international investigation team, which is going to carry out the planetary defense investigation and work with also our engineering team at APL that's leading the mission and leading the operations to ensure that everything comes together to meet the requirements and our measurements that we want to accomplish for planetary defense for DART to be a success. But really, it's important because DART is just the start. This is the first planetary defense mission for NASA, but it's not going to be the last either. And so we want to get this information in a way that we can build on going forward. Tell me about the DART spacecraft itself. Uh, What's unique about it and where it was built? The DART spacecraft was built at APL in Laurel, Maryland, and uh, and uh, it's about two meters on side um, as a main cube. So the main body of the spacecraft, where most of the mass is, is, uh, is sort of the size of a small golf cart, if you will, or, or a vending machine, sometimes we say. And one of the distinguishing features, though, if you looked at DART now, um, is that it has these rollout solar arrays, ROSAs. And so these things were wrapped up like rolls of aluminum foil when it launched. And then when you got into space, they go out and they're 18 meters tip to tip then. So this makes the uh, looks the spacecraft look much larger. Of course, they're very lightweight. They don't have a lot of mass. So as far as the deflecting the asteroid part goes, they don't really matter very much. It's the main body of the spacecraft that we worry about. Um, DART has one instrument on it. It's called the Draco camera. And this camera it was also built and developed at APL. And it has heritage from the camera that flew on the New Horizons mission that captured the spectacular images of Pluto that I think we all remember from a number of years ago. So using that sort of design, it was modified in order to go onto the DART spacecraft. And that payload is really important because it will give us images of what this asteroid looks like, Dimorphos, which we've never seen before. From Earth, you can't separate Didymos from Dimorphos. We really don't know what this asteroid looks like. But really importantly, the Draco images are used to do the autonomous navigation at the end of the mission so that we'll ensure that we hit Dimorphos, which is a challenge in itself. Is the autonomous navigation a new technology? Is this pushing science? Yeah, The autonomous navigation smart nav is what we call that system on board DART is one of the challenges and one of the new technologies for this mission. We're targeting an asteroid that's 140 meters in diameter. This will be the smallest object that NASA has sent a spacecraft to. To complicate matters, it's going around Didymos, which is 780 meters in diameter. And since these objects are so close together and you're coming in so fast, 14,000 miles per hour, the Draco images will not be able to distinguish these two objects from each other until the last hour of the mission. Before that, they just look like a single point of light. And so you can see clearly that you need to have your spacecraft smart enough to use those images, fire its thrusters, target onto Dimorphos, and hit Dimorphos uh, as nearly head on as possible. And that's where the smart nav technology developed at APL comes in. Um, it's a really good Uh, new technology for planetary defense for targeting these small objects. Um, But also one of the main challenges, because like I was saying, we don't know what Dimorphos looks like. We don't know its shape from other asteroids we've been to. We know they have a whole variety of shapes. Um, And so there's been extensive testing that's gone on in order to meet this challenge. Um, And uh, and we're uh, looking forward to the demonstration. Well, give me a a little bit of a sense of all those years of development uh, and and the teams involved with once the idea was uh, that we are going to try and and affect the trajectory of this asteroid. What kind of craft would be capable of doing that? How did that process evolve? 
like everything, it's hard to talk about spacecraft development because there's lots of paths that like don't work out. I, all ideas are on the table at the early stages of there. I think first and foremost, DART is a very focused mission. And that was always very important into, into this whole discussion. Um, a lot of times when you get the opportunity to fly in space, you want to be able to do all sorts of things because there's so much that we could do and so much that still remains to be done. But DART really has one purpose, and that is to hit Dimorphos and deflect it how it goes around Didymos. And so really the spacecraft is very slimmed down. It uses as much heritage technology as possible so that you can concentrate on those new challenges like the smart nav navigation in order to autonomously target onto that asteroid during the last hours of the mission. Uh, so in a lot of ways it was meant to um, be robust and to be focused. And this is what you would want if you were potentially having to deflect an asteroid in the future. You want something that is as simple and possible, as simple as possible in order to enable the mission to succeed. And how fast will it be traveling when it uh, hits target? So it'll be going at 6.1 kilometers per second or uh, 14,000 miles per hour. Uh, that's really the whole basis about how this much smaller spacecraft, like I said, the size of a small golf cart, can actually deflect something that the size of a sports stadium or a great pyramid. Um, you know, it's about 100 times smaller, this spacecraft. You know, and so it's kind of remarkable that it's able to deflect this much larger object at all. Um, it really is only about a 1% deflection, but coming in very fast, this 14,000 miles per hour is key to enabling that. Where were you at liftoff when the spacecraft f went into space? I was out in a dark field in California at Vandenberg Space Force Base, uh, looking up along with everybody else out there. Um, and there was a, it was a great night. Um, people had warned me that maybe there's fog and things, and we didn't have anything like that. It was a beautiful, clear night. Uh, you could see very clearly, uh, you know, the spacecraft launch and the excitement and the, and the cheers. And, uh, you know, that said, a lot of my colleagues were working very hard in operations and back in uh, not watching the, the launch and live, but uh, everything went just flawlessly. And, uh, and uh, everybody was very, very pleased with the launch. Where are the possible points of failure for this mission along the way? Where, are the, the, where, where will you be holding your breath? Obviously, liftoff well, was any... one of them, right? So it made liftoff. So after that, uh, where are you going to be really watching to see, yes, this technology performs as expected? Yeah, so after liftoff, we had a 30-day commissioning period, and that's where you turn everything on in space for the first time, and you do them sort of one at a time. You rule out the solar arrays. You practice using the Next Sea Ion Propulsion Engine, which is another new technology. You open the door for Draco. You take your first images of stars, and I'm happy to say that those 30 days of commissioning also went fabulously, and uh, so that was another big milestone to get through after launch. So now the spacecraft is cruising on its way to the Dynamos Dimorphos system, and we're running a lot of rehearsals for executing the commands and the sequences that will be done right before launch. And so there's a lot of testing that we can do during this cruise period in order to ensure that we don't have any, uh, any issues during this last coming there. That said, it really is NASA's first planetary defense mission. And anytime you do something for the first time, it's because it's never been done before. And part of that challenge is part of the reason that you need to do this test. If we were confident that this would work, we wouldn't need to be doing DART. But DART needs to see uh, what it's like to target a small asteroid that you've never seen before autonomously. And how much do you deflect it? This is a big unknown, actually. And it's not because, uh, because the DART spacecraft will bring in its mass and its velocity. We know that. But what we don't know is how much ejecta is going to come out. And we think this is actually going to increase the amount of push that you get, the amount of that you deflect the asteroid. If there's a lot of ejecta, you can imagine it's sort of like a little jet engine that adds to that and uh, deflects the asteroid even more. So this is one of the main things scientifically that we really want to do. We have done uh, models and tests, but it really depends on the structure of the asteroid, what it's made of, the boulders, how regolith it is or how sandy, how strong it is. Um, and all of those are factors. So doing this real world test on a real world asteroid in space of this size that is a concern to potentially hitting the Earth in the future is, uh, makes DART really well set up for this planetary defense demonstration. What uh, price tag is NASA using for this overall project? 
So the overall price of Dart, again, starting in 2015 and going through 2023, so eight years, is $330 million. That includes the launch vehicle and all of the operations and the development. And again, when is the exact date of impact planned? It is September 26th of later this year, 2022, um, and nominally at 7.14 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That might change by a few minutes, but about 7 p.m. on the East Coast. Um, is what we're looking at. And it's really going to be um, an exciting time, a spectacular time. As the Draco camera images are used autonomously to target the asteroid, they'll also be streaming back to Earth one per second. And so uh, at first they will just be a dot of light, but those last few images during the last uh, minutes and the last seconds where we really get to see this asteroid for the first time will be spectacular to be shared. How soon after the impact will you know that the intended goal was successful? Well, we will know pretty soon because one of the main goals is impacting the asteroid. And so those images are going to come streaming back and the asteroid is going to get bigger and bigger in the field of view. And then uh, that signal is going to stop and the DART spacecraft will have done its purpose. And that really is these fundamental goals of the mission. Now, how much did we deflect the asteroid is also an important measurement. And that's where, like I said, the telescopes on the Earth will have to weigh in on this. Um, I should mention that DART also carries a CubeSat contributed by the Italian Space Agency. It's called Licia Cube. And it'll get some spectacular images of the ejecta. Um, but then it just goes on speeding by out of the system. So it won't be able to measure how much we deflected the asteroid, but it'll send those images back for a few weeks or months after DART's impact with Dimorphos. The telescopes on Earth will get to work right away. But because you are measuring something which is a pretty fine signal, it used to be 11 hours and 55 minutes, and now maybe it's going to be 11 hours and 45 minutes, we're going to get data for weeks or months. And because we're targeting this time where the distance between Earth and the Dynamo system is minimized, the telescopes will be able to get really great data for three or four months after DART's impact. And so we might have an initial estimate, but that'll continue to be refined throughout all of 2022. You mentioned the Italians. I also read that the European Space Agency is doing a follow-up mission. Can you explain their role? Yeah, uh, the European Space Agency has a mission called HERA. It's going to launch in 2024, and it's going to rendezvous with the Didymos Dimorphos system in 2026. This is so exciting um, because by rendezvous, I mean orbit. It's going to stay in the system for many months. So it will be able to make some detailed measurements that will really complement DART's mission. For one, it'll be able to see the crater that was made by the DART spacecraft on Dimorphos. This will give us really important insight into the character of that asteroid, how strong it really was by the after effects that were left by DART there on the surface. It'll be able to get the mass of Dimorphos, which is a tricky measurement that we won't be able to make with DART. From DART, we'll be able to get the shape of the asteroid, and we'll make some assumptions about what it's made out of based on uh, meteorite studies and other studies that we've done. Um, but the HERA mission will be able to get that mass very ex uh, specifically. So these combined with the DART mission, DART and HERA together will aid planetary defense in a way that's bigger than either one could do on their own. So it's very complimentary. Uh, HERA team members uh, are on the DART investigation team. So we're fully working together in order to have DART fully inform what HERA does when that gets there in 2026. Is there any other country in the world, say Russia, for example, that are, is working on similar projects or is it alone through NASA and, and APL? NASA uh, works uh, with a number of international agencies on planetary defense, and I, it really is one of the pillars of planetary defense, is that uh, international cooperation for this international issue. You know, that said, we're not aware of any other missions right now that are planned to DART will be the first one for asteroid deflection. Uh, but uh, really opening up uh, all of the data that we get on asteroids, all of the data that NASA gets on asteroids is publicly available. You can go on the web and find this at any given time, and it's going to be the same with all of these planetary defense missions. Uh, you know, again, international cooperation is just very key here. Uh, we're all on this planet together. In addition to uh, sharing the data with scientists, I, I saw that there's a big effort to involve the public in the DART mission. Can you tell me a little bit about that? 
We have a number of ways that the public can follow along. Uh, we've got a Planetary Defender campaign. You can go to the website for the dartjgoapl.edu um, and become a Planetary Defender. Uh, so that's kind of fun. We actually have a you know a VR spacecraft that you can uh, make show up in your living room and twirl it all around. It's based on the real CAD model, actually. So it's kind of fascinating. I love to use it myself, actually, to zoom in and, and see the instruments uh, on there and things like that. Um, and uh, there's some other... Uh, some of the resources that we have online as well. And uh, we also, uh, because the distance between Earth and the Didymo system is going to be minimized, um, if you have sort of a, a pretty decent amateur telescope or a museum, you might be able to look up. You won't be able to see how much we've deflected the asteroid, but you should be able to see Didymos in the telescope around the time of impact. So that's exciting. We have about three, four minutes left, and I wanted to use that time to to talk a little bit more about you and your career. You're obviously so energized by the work you do. What inspired you to go in this direction with your career? You know, I uh, have thought about that a little bit, and I still just come back to Star Wars. So I'm going to go with Star Wars again here. Uh, I think as a kid, I was really just taken by uh, those visions of different worlds. Um, I really loved that there was worlds with two suns or worlds made of ice or worlds where people lived in clouds and and all of these sorts of things. And I think that that just uh, that made me and then you look around and there's so much about our own solar system that we have yet to discover and just these fundamental things that we're doing for the first time. And so it's really sort of a childhood dream come true to be able to turning some of this uh, science fiction like we were talking about in the beginning to reality. Your uh, biography notes that there is an asteroid named in your honor because of your, your, um, your work in, with meteors and asteroids. Uh, tell me a, a little bit about how you focused on this partic- particular aspect of planetary science. Well, being at APL has really given me a lot of opportunities to get involved in missions. um, And it's been very exciting to take sort of my meteorite research, which was much more looking at the first billion years, the first very early parts of the solar system, and then apply it to something that's really present day um, that concerns us not just with how the solar system formed and evolved, but what it means for us to be part of it today in the future. And, And being at APL, I got my first opportunity to work on the mission with the messenger mission, which was a fabulous opportunity, the first spacecraft to orbit the planet Mercury. Um, And I was working with the camera team, and we got to see parts of the planet that had never been seen before. Um, And so it's it's very exciting now to be working on a project like DART, which is also this groundbreaking, pioneering mission um, in planetary defense. In the years since you've been in this field, uh, when when I I was looking at lots of the videos for the DART mission, and it's not... um, Hard not to notice that there's quite a few women involved in this project overall. And I'm just wondering about STEM studies and how much they have impacted the number of women going into your field. I definitely think that we take a lot of pride in our DART team and in the membership of our DART team and in our projects at APL. Um, And so I think DART is just indicative of that. Uh, And uh, I do hope that this trend is going to continue. So... As we close here, uh, I I wanted to sort of wrap up where we started. You've called it a historic mission, groundbreaking mission. DART's success will mean what for planetary scientists, for Earth scientists, and for the Earth itself? DART's success, and really even just DART's launch and DART's existence, is really us taking this first step to potentially prevent asteroids from hitting the Earth in the future. Like I said in the beginning, Earth has been hit by asteroids for billions of years. This is not new. This is not the new part. There's not a new threat here. What's so exciting is that we are taking this first step to potentially prevent that in the future. So DART being successful and DART success will mean that we have this capability to target these asteroids that might potentially be a threat to the Earth in the future and potentially do something about that. And that's very exciting. Dr. Nancy Chabot, Planetary Chief Scientist for Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Lab and the Coordination Lead for NASA's DART mission, a historic one. Thank you very much for spending time with C-SPAN. Thank you very much for having me. Coming up next in Q&A, as we learn more about space science in 2022, we'll be learning about the Webb Space Telescope, which launched at the last quarter of 2021 and has some important milestones in the year ahead. And we have engine start. 
and liftoff. Decollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. That's video of the Christmas morning 2021 launch of the $10 billion James Webb telescope. Dr. Meredith McGregor is a space scientist at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And let me start by asking that description uh, that we heard on the video to the edge of the universe, to the edge of time. What is the mission of the Webb telescope? Yeah, so the James Webb Space Telescope is really going to kind of revolutionize a lot of different areas of science. Um, when we say kind of to the edge of the universe, to the edge of time, one of the main science goals of the telescope is to actually look back at the very early history of our universe. We want to try and see galaxies as they were first being born in the early universe. And the reason that James Webb can actually do this is because it's an infrared telescope. So we humans, our eyes look at visual wavelengths of light, which is actually a really tiny piece of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. That's all wavelengths of light that we can, you know, that exist. And so James Webb is looking at the infrared, which is just a little bit longer in wavelength, a little bit redder, um, basically heat. So our bodies, you know, we give off heat. Everything in the universe gives off heat. And the wavelength of that is infrared light. So JBST is going to be looking at infrared light. How does that help us see the early universe? Um, as it turns out, you know, our universe started with what we call a big bang, and then it, you know, went through a period of called inflation, where it grew really quickly. And so you can think of the universe essentially like a loaf of raisin bread. You know, you put it in the oven and it starts to rise. The space, the bread in between the raisins actually starts to stretch apart. And, you know, the raisins stay the same size. They're not changing, but they're growing apart from each other. So if you then, you know, think of our universe as the bread and the galaxies as all the raisins, right? The space during this period of inflation between all these, you know, the part of the universe and during the continual expansion of the universe, that space between the galaxies actually starts to expand and stretch. And as it does that, it takes all the light emitted from those galaxies and it also stretches it, which means that it shifts from being kind of visual light that we could see with our eyes to these infrared wavelengths. So by launching an infrared telescope, we can actually look further back in the universe than we've ever been able to see before. And hopefully that's going to let us actually see some of these really early galaxies and try and piece together basically the evolution of our universe. So uh, this might be an obvious question, but why does it help us as a human race to understand more about the origins of the universe at this point in time? Yeah, I mean, I guess from my perspective as a scientist, you know, one of the coolest things we can do as humans is actually try and think about where we come from, how we got to be here. And then we can try and think about whether there might be other, you know, civilizations, other life in the universe, right? And that to me is just kind of a, a really exciting question to ask. And it's a privilege, you know, as a human that we actually get to think about those things. How will Webb help us determine if there is other life in the universe? Yeah, so we talked a bit about the sort of galaxy history of the universe science question of Webb, but you know, one of the other main science questions it's going to try and address is to both understand how planetary systems like ours form, um, and then also try and characterize individual planets in those systems. So we can actually image the disks of dust and gas that these planetary systems are forming out of, and then we can try and you know, see what the composition of them is, what kind of gases are in there, um, and to use that to try and inform, you know, how we actually form the planets in the first place. And then Webb is going to take actual spectros spectroscopic, um, it's going to take actual spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. So exoplanets are planets orbiting other stars. And so we're going to actually take spectra, which is basically a fingerprint of what's in the atmosphere, and look for things like ozone or water or CO2, um, and try and actually take these, you know, thousands of exoplanets that we know about to date, and really start to characterize them in a way that we can say something about, you know, what the conditions on their surfaces might be like. How is the Webb telescope different from the Hubble? Yeah, so it's really different in quite a few ways. I mean, in many ways, JST is building off the legacy of Hubble. You know, NASA has a real history now of launching these great observatories over several decades. Um, for one, it's a much bigger telescope. So Hubble is only about, you know, two and a half meters in diameter, and, and James Webb is really like a six meter 6.6.5 meter telescope. So that's a huge difference in size. Um, and when we think of telescopes, we usually, you can kind of think of them like a light bucket, right? We're trying to collect light from the early universe or we're collecting light from an exoplanet. And the bigger the bucket, the more light you collect, right? The more detailed the science we can do. 
Another difference is this wavelength issue, right? So Hubble operates at sort of the visible to what we call ultraviolet light, which is actually shorter than the visible light we can see with our eyes. And James Webb is now towards the infrared, so it's a, towards the other end of the spectrum. So there's a real difference in, you know, size, real difference in wavelength, and also a real difference in location. Um, Hubble is actually in a pretty kind of low Earth orbit. It's orbiting our Earth, but it's not that far away. And we've launched JWST to this what we call an L2 or the Lagrange point, um, which is much, much, much farther away, which is why it's taking so many months for it to actually get to its final position. How many months will it take to get there? Yeah, so it takes, I think, roughly one to two months for it to actually reach its location. Um, it's not going to actually start doing science until this summer because there's about a six month long commissioning period um, where, you know, all these different steps have to be taken to make sure that the telescope is actually functioning correctly. And then we can start doing real science with it. Well, on the functioning correctly part, of course, Hubble famously had a blurred lens uh, that was able to be fixed in space by a shuttle mission. I, I would presume that the distance that Webb is traveling precludes any in-space repairs. So uh, what are the challenges of the engineering that, what, I guess more properly, what were the lessons learned from Hubble that were applied to the development of Webb? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Uh, JWST is much too far away for us to actually service at this point in time. Um, and I, that's, you know, why there was so much pressure on this actual launch and deployment of the telescope, because you have to get it right the first time, right? There's no way of fixing it. Um, so the problem with Hubble was what we call uh, an aberration, right? Um, because Hubble has lenses, mirrors in it, right? Those there's actually optical effects that can cause images to get distorted if those mirrors are slightly out of shape. Um, and so one of the main things that was done with Webb was to have, um, you know, I think there's four different mirrors that the light actually, you know, reflects off of before actually going into the science instruments. And that helps to cut down on the possibility should completely cut down the possibility of any kind of issues like what we had with Hubble. Um, so the optical engineering is just much more sophisticated on web, um, and that should really eliminate the possibility of turning it on and getting that blurry image that you know happened with Hubble. How long ago was Webb first envisioned? Yeah, so um, the way that astronomy kind of functions is that every 10 years we get together as a community. This is run by the National Academy of Sciences, and we have what's called a decadal survey. Um, and it's really a moment where the astronomy community puts in input of what we want to see happen in the field, what kind of science questions are really key to ask, what missions do we need to answer those, and then we publish a report. Um, and so this actually just happened last year the 2020 Decadal Survey, and James Webb was selected as kind of the mission that was, you know, the next thing to launch in astrophysics back in the 2000 Decadal Survey. Um, so, you know, it's been about 20 years that we've been kind of slowly developing and building towards actually launching this mission. In uh, stories that I read, it suggested that the deployment was 14 years behind the expected schedule, and I mentioned the $10 billion price tag that that was 20 times over the initial bu budget estimations. What's the backstory on those numbers? Yeah, so that's a, you know, complicated question. Um, so I'll say, you know, for the start, right, $10 billion spent over 20 years is not actually a huge um, amount of money per year spent. And, you know, at, at the typical average, um, James Webb was costing about 50% of sort of like the NASA astrophysics budget. Um, I think... You know, there was a little bit of an un underestimation of, of how complicated launching a telescope like this would be, right? This is the first time we've ever launched a telescope that's this far away and has this complicated of a deployment. Um, and it's really the next step to what we need to do in astrophysics. But, you know, as with all great ideas and dreams, sometimes it ends up being a lot more complicated than you think it's going to be. Um, and so, you know, I think we've gotten to this point in astrophysics where the telescopes are so complicated that, you know, we're really looking at this landscape where we're actually like taking decades to build instruments, right? Um, I mean, I think it's really cool to put this in a human perspective, right? Hubble was launched in 1990. I was born in 1989. So I was one year old at the time that Hubble was launched. And I still use Hubble today, 30 years later. And, you know, in 2000, I was 
not even graduated from high school. <laughs> so in the time that we've built web, right, I've gone from being a teenager to a professional astrophysicist. And so I think to put that in this kind of like human perspective, right, we need to start thinking of these telescopes as these long term projects where they're actually spanning entire careers of scientists. Um, and so we need to take that into account when we go forward, right? So we don't end up like we have with Webb. We still have a wonderful instrument. I'm really excited to use it, right? Um, but as we think about the next generation of great observatories, the things that are being proposed in the 2020 Decadal Survey, we need to be a little more realistic, I think, about how long they're going to take to actually be built and launched. Because I would presume that the technology continues to evolve as those years go by, which means yes. constant updates to what you're planning and building. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, in order to actually launch something into space, um, NASA has what are called TRL levels or technology readiness levels. And so you can't just launch something into space that you've like only ever tested on the ground, right? And then now put it on a $10 million flagship observatory. And so there's stages that technology have to actually go through before they're ready to go on something big like web. Um, you know, you need to test them on the ground, you need to test them in a vacuum, right? You need to test them on a suborbital mission. Um, and so, you know, that doesn't mean that you're like switching out the technology right before you actually launch the mission. While we're talking about its particular technology, on January 8th, a very important, important step in the de deployment, uh, which was the telescope. We have some video from NASA of that. Talk to me about that stage, uh, how much engineers were holding their breaths uh, at that stage, and uh, what the outcome was. Yeah, so... so since its launch on Christmas Day, right, until this on um, January 8th, uh, Webb had been slowly basically unfolding its pieces. Um, sometimes people refer to it as like the origami telescope because it's so big that in order to actually fit it into the rocket, it had to be basically folded up on itself. And so this last piece was actually unfolding that sort of gold primary mirror that's kind of the main collect light collecting area of the telescope. And it had two wings. Right. So it had a middle part, but then the two wings were folded in on itself. And so over two days, you know, we folded out the last two of those wings. And that was really the last major deployment step of the telescope. So it was a big deal because everything up until that point had gone well. And now we unfolded the primary mirror of the telescope. And that means that you have, you know, a fully unfolded functioning telescope out in space. Um, so, you know, now what remains is all the commissioning steps and aligning of mirrors and, you know, making sure that the images and the data we're going to get back are amazing. But the telescope successfully unfolded itself, which was really quite exciting to hear. Are any of those next steps also hold your breath steps? Um, I don't think, you know, in my mind, people might have different opinions on this. The actual, like, the part that I was most terrified about was the, like, unfolding of different pieces of the telescope. And not even, like, that primary mirror part. I think um, I was most scared about the secondary mirror, which has to sit out in front of the primary mirror and was on these sort of long spindly legs. Um, and so that had to, like, swing out and actually lock into place, which is something we've never done in space before. Um, so when that worked, it was like, hoo hoo. Um, what's happening now is, you know, if you look at that gold primary mirror, it has a whole bunch of different, what look like different pieces to it. Um, and so those are actually little different smaller mirrors, and they have to all be moved with these actuators on the back in order to basically align the light, right? So they're all collecting light from space, and then they need to align the light to that secondary mirror that's hanging out in front of it. Um, and so it's, you know, lots of little like tweaking, moving all of those mirrors around to actually align the light. Um, so obviously, you know, knock on wood, like things can always still go wrong, but there's no more like major pieces that need to go into place for the telescope to function. And so, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will get some really exciting data in a matter of months. In addition to the engineering challenges, which uh, are unfolding on schedule, are there any other uh, space related challenges to the functioning of it? For example, could meteorites be a, a, an issue for it? Is the intensity of the sun's light possibly, will it impact the results? Yeah, so the sun, I think we should be good. Um, and that was one of the major deployments, actually. Uh, so if you look at pictures of the space telescope, right, there's this giant thing sitting on the back of it, which is actually a sun shield. Um, and so that sun shield is meant to block the sun's light. Um, that's right. So we talked about the fact that this is an infrared telescope. 
infrared is heat, right? So it would be not ideal to have it close to Earth, right? This is why we've moved it so far away, because the Earth and all the humans on it give off heat. The sun is a very hot object. And so that giant shield on the back will always be positioned between the, you know, the telescope side of the telescope, right? The actual mirrors and optics and instruments and the sun in order to block the light. Um, now, in terms of meteors and meteorites and things like that, there is always some risk, um, right? You know, space is not a completely clean place. There's lots of debris floating around. Um, you know, I asked an engineer at some point about this and uh, Webb doesn't actually have the capability to kind of steer itself away from anything. So, you know, the risks are low, right? The risks of a meteorite hitting Earth are low, even though there's our you know, current movie right now about just that happening. Um, but I think, you know, we're just operating on the assumption that it's a low risk and hopefully everything will be fine. Staying with the, um, the sun shield, um, the, your answer explained one part of a, a sentence that I had underlined in a Science Magazine article. The sun shield is both an infrared telescope's only hope, and that's how you explain that part. But it also said it's also its Achilles heel. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that was that sun shield in my mind was was sort of a risk and that it was like a major deployment that had to happen. Um, so that had to actually kind of unfold and then tension, basically. And it has multiple layers. Um, and so that deployment was one that I think a lot of people were very worried about um, because it's made out of this very, very fine thin material um and there was a lot of risk in like launching it that something might happen to it right it might tear um and then it wouldn't work and then we'd have no sun shield right and you can't have an infrared telescope without a sun shield and in fact like one of the delays that happened on the ground when we we're you know building the telescope was actually that sun shield when it was being tested its deployment like tearing a little bit um and so that was, you know, another moment in the last several weeks where I think people were very relieved when the whole thing successfully tensioned. Uh, could you talk to me a little bit? Uh, you're uh, a, a space scientist at the University of Colorado, uh, and I'm, I'm going to use that as a jumping off point to understand how NASA works with researchers okay. such as yourself and, uh, and how that whole uh, public and private and university partnership works with Webb. Yeah. Um, so... Now that web is launched, and once it starts actually taking data, um, then it is an kind of open science instrument. Um, so this is the same as Hubble launches. Um, any scientist who has an exciting idea for what you want to do with a telescope, you go through a process where you write a proposal, um, and you propose your idea, and you try and convince other people that this is a worthwhile thing to do with the telescope. Then all those proposals go in and are read by committees of professional scientists who rate and judge them against each other. Um, and what the telescope actually does is some subset of that science, right? So the committees go, they rank those proposals, they pick a few that they think are most exciting, and then those are the proposals that actually get to observe with the telescope. Um, and so this is how NASA pretty much runs all of its observatories. Hubble runs this way. Things on the ground that aren't NASA-based, like the ALMA array, which I use quite a bit, also go through a proposal process. So any scientist like me at a university who wants to use the telescope, you know, I write proposals. I submit them and then, you know, hope for the best. Uh, and I think it's really a testament to how in demand these instruments are, um, that something like Hubble, which has been up for 30 years, is still oversubscribed by a factor of about, you know, 12 to 13 to 1, um, which means, you know, for every one hour of actual observing time that's available in the telescope, there's 12 hours of proposed observations that go in from the community. Um, and so these instruments are really in very high demand. I presume that's the international community, not just U.S. researchers. Yeah, yeah. So international community. And uh, are the results all open sourced? Yeah, so all the data from the telescopes eventually become public. Um, usually the way it works is that the data comes down. Um, you get a proprietary period as the original proposal of the idea to do what you want with the data. That can vary somewhere between like three months to a year, depending upon the facility. And then at the end of that, the data becomes public and goes into the archive, and then anybody in the world can access it and use it. Where was the Webb telescope built? So it was actually built in a lot of different places. Um, so some the instruments were all built at different locations, right? And then um, I actually saw it in person at NASA Goddard, um, where a lot of kind of 
construction of the mirror and um, testing of it was actually done. And then the telescope was moved to Houston for a bit. And then it was at Northrop Grumman and different pieces were added at different points, right? And then when it was finally assembled, they put it on a ship and like shipped it down to French Guiana. Um, and so I, I think it's, you know, pretty cool to just think about this telescope being constructed basically all over the world and then like shipped by shipping container down to French Guiana to actually be launched. Um, so a lot of people in a lot of different places had a hand in actually building the whole telescope and putting it together. Did you tune into the live launch? I did. Yeah. Um, it was at like, four or five in the morning here on Christmas, um, but I was up watching it. What were your emotions or reactions as you were watching it? Uh, it was just so cool. Uh, I mean, launches are phenomenal. If you've never actually like watched a launch live, it's just amazing to see that. Um, for me, you know, in my career, I've been hearing about James Webb for like the entire time that I've been a professional astronomer since I was, you know, in college, just kind of thinking of doing astrophysics as a degree. Um, and so I've, you know, been like learning about it and thinking about it and wanting to use it and hearing about it for, you know, two decades and to actually then see it in a rocket, like on the launch pad. And for a while I was just thinking they're like, Oh my God, they're going to delay it again. Right. Like something's going to happen. We're going to be like minute out. They're going to say, no, no launch. And then, I don't know, it just happens so quickly, right? All of a sudden you're watching and then the rockets ignite, the boosters ignite and like it's gone, it's in space. I don't know, it was a really cool moment to actually like watch that. A very unique Christmas morning. Can you anticipate how it will change your research? Yeah, so I'm really interested in trying to study how planetary systems form and evolve and think about whether there's other planets in the universe that might have life. Um, and so for me, I'm really interested in kind of all those science cases for Webb, hoping to use it to actually, you know, characterize these disks and think about their composition and how water and material is actually inherited from planet formation into planets. And then also think about the atmospheres themselves and characterize them. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes with some of these telescopes, you, you don't like, we have science cases, right? Um, and we can make so many predictions, but then, I don't know, there's always like this is why I love observational astronomy because you can just go and point at an object and I get new data and I know that I'm the first person in the universe to ever see this and sometimes you can't predict what you're going to find right we find completely new things and so I think you know probably some of the most exciting science results that are kind of come out of web are things that I'm not even sure I can tell you right now, right? Um, and I think this kind of area of astrobiology and life in the universe and planets and planet formation is one of those areas where we're sort of like right on the edge right now. Um, and I think we're gonna learn some pretty cool things in the next decade or so. So it sounds like you have been excited about space science most of your life. What, what uh, got you started? Yeah, um, so I have kind of always been excited about science. I got really into science fairs when I was a small child. I did my first science fair when I was in kindergarten. It was a project on how a siphon helps a toilet flush. Um, and I was always just really fascinated by physics, trying to understand how the world works and kind of put the mathematics behind that. Um, and so I wanted to be a physics major, and I actually started doing astronomy in college. Um, I, on a complete whim, took an introductory astronomy course, and I just loved it. We got to spend nights at an observatory, and I had never really considered that as something I was going to do as a career. Um, and then it was kind of full steam ahead from there. In your bio, uh, it, 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 you write, outside of research, I'm actively involved in a number of outreach programs and organizations supporting women in STEM fields. I recently designed an astronomy curriculum for the Carnegie First Light Program, a weekend science program for Washington, D.C. middle school students, and I serve as a worldwide telescope ambassador and taught science club for girls throughout most of college and graduate school. I, I wanted to read that because um, STEM science, uh, STEM studies have been so important in the national educational debate for the past two decades. What are you seeing about the interest among young people in space science particularly, and most importantly, among young women, since that's been a field of interest for you? Yeah, um, so I, you know, I care deeply about that from a personal level, right? I remember being in college and being the only woman in my astrophysics classes and, you know, feeling, you know, out of place, right? Like this, you know, is something I'm passionate about, 
but it's not a place in which I see myself represented amongst the people who are doing it professionally. Um, and I think astronomy has come a long way recently. We've, we've started to recognize this, right, and take action. And there's space for people like me who are professionals who care about this to actually make an impact. Um, and I think astronomy you know, from a larger standpoint, right, is just cool. It's a pretty fun place where, you know, the public and, and kids can just get excited about space and looking at cool things and thinking about how the universe formed. And so in my mind, that makes us a really kind of unique science. And it means that we should take advantage of this, right? It means that this is a place where we can really reach out to the community and we can really get people interested and we can use it as an opportunity to teach science. Um, and I, I love being at um, CU Boulder because we actually have one of the largest undergraduate astronomy majors in the country. We have more than 400 um, college students majoring in astrophysics. And so I get to teach a class on life in the universe to 200 students. Um, and it's just great fun. Do they ask different questions at age 18 and 20 than you might have asked 20 years ago? Um, it's an interesting question. You know, I don't think so. I think fundamentally, like, most humans just really want to understand where we come from. It's kind of one of the most human questions we can ask. Um, they want to know whether we're alone in the universe and how we got here and how things formed and how things work. Um, and I think that just relates to anybody at any age. You know, I get the same questions when I give public lectures as I do when I teach college students. And they're the same questions that professional astronomers are actually trying to answer in their research. Well, thank you for giving us a bit of a primer on the work of the James Webb Telescope launched on Christmas Day just a few weeks back. And remind us as we close when the first pictures will be seen. So I think we should get the first science results sometime this summer. Um, the commissioning should take about six months. So that kind of puts us in like June or July when I think we're going to start actually getting some data from the telescope. Dr. Meredith McGregor, space scientist, University of Colorado at Boulder, thank you very much for helping us understand more about your work and what we will learn from this $10 billion public investment in understanding the universe. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 